One of my earliest childhood memories is of tiny me sitting in front of a much larger keyboard, attempting to follow finger patterns as my stern piano teacher admonished me. I was introduced to the world of music early on. Since most children were finding a hobby to follow, my parents thought it worthwhile to get me involved in the world of music. That was 10 years ago. And since then, my relationship with the piano has been tumultuous to say the least. It began with six-year-old me dreading class with my boring mustache teacher. As time progressed and I learned under a few more instructors, my interest grew along with my dedication. Finally, at the age of eight, I found a teacher that I loved. I would go to class every week, be reminded to practice, come home, play a few lines and go right back over and over again. As the years passed, piano got pushed to the sidelines. I still attended classes and I still had my upright proudly displayed at home, but something was missing. I kept at it, attempting to get myself to practice, but inadvertently, I would always leave it off till the last day. At times, it got so bad that I would pretend to fall sick to miss class. I would scrounge around for any excuse possible. In high school, academic stress ramped up and I had no choice but to confront the monster in the room. The truth was that I just didn't enjoy it anymore. Now, don't get me wrong, I love music. I'm not going to commit utter blasphemy by insulting the instrument or the art, both of which I admire immensely. It just didn't work for me. And it took me months of thinking and experimenting to pinpoint what exactly it was that I didn't enjoy. The combination of weekly practice, music exams, and monotonous pieces was grating on me. But by this point, I had been playing for almost my entire life. I had grown up telling people I played the piano. It was one of the few hobbies I could fall back on and formed a large portion of my extracurricular portfolio. So what was I to do? Choose to abandon this instrument that I had spent so much time on, thus sacrificing a chunk of my college resume or keep doing a hobby that gave me zero joy. In my quest to make the right choice, I looked around and saw just how many of my friends had the same problem, whether it was debate, art, or dance. An overwhelming number of them were trapped into doing the same activities that they had initially loved, only to dislike them, all for applications and portfolios. After all, consistency is key, isn't it? Whether it's to satisfy your parents, your teachers, or safe face in front of your friends. The list of reasons to keep going is endless despite the unhappiness and monotony that activity adds to your already limited time. In fact, a few of my friends even mentioned how they wouldn't watch this talk simply because it was far too real and confronting that they were stuck in the same cycle was a freaky thought. And it really is. Seeing my misery mirrored in those around me, I was forced to stop and ask myself, why do we continue to subject ourselves to such things over and over again? The answer, you guessed it, college. For most of us, college has become the backdrop for almost everything we do. I vaguely recall the time before the word university became the center of everything. We had this miracle thing called free time. We had other things to talk about. My value and self-worth weren't defined by my grades or my SAT score. And I wasn't constantly stressing about having to confine my personality into five hundred perfect words to impress some admissions officer I was likely to never meet. But now it's 24 seven college talk. Even when we aren't talking about it directly, we are. Attending a marathon is no longer about supporting and donating to a good cause. It's about showcasing service. Joining a debate league isn't about discussing the state of the world and finding solutions. It's about showing off your strong communication getting stellar grades, taking challenging courses, involving yourself in the community, developing your leadership skills. For as long as I can remember, it's all been building towards this one goal. The constant strain of having to be well-rounded has taken its toll on us. But this makes me ask, shouldn't we be allowed to have a few rough edges at the age of 16? For starters, I don't even know what I want to do for the rest of my life. So many of us are still conflicted about our majors. Having a specific career stream is a far off thought. I've come to dread social events. Every single adult wants to know what my college plans are. And what's ironic 
Is that just like them? I don't know the answer to that question. Over the years, I've learned to cobble together an answer that satisfies society at large. But am I really expected to find this answer to my future at the age 16? What if I make the wrong decision? Choose to go down the law track and realize years later that I've wasted thousands of dollars studying something that I really don't enjoy. So, unsure of what we want to do for the rest of our lives, we continue to pile on extracurriculars, hoping that while writing our applications, they'll all form a coherent picture. We leave behind the hobbies we love, taking up activities we don't enjoy as much. Sure, they're not the best, but they might look, but they definitely will look good in the eyes of the examiner. But here's my thing. Why do we have to be sure about what we want to do for the rest of our life when so many other successful people won't? You may have heard of Jeff Bezos, billionaire, founder of Amazon. Ring any bells? Well, he didn't always have his mind set on entrepreneurial success. In fact, after graduating from Princeton, he worked on Wall Street, building a career in computer science. But that wasn't what made him a household name. Years later, on a random drive from New York to Seattle, the idea for Amazon was born. Another living example of following your passions and defying expectations is five-time world boxing champion, Mary Com. Raised by a poor family of farmers, she chose to break the mold and enter a male-dominated field. Now, she is the only boxer in the world to have eight world championship medals. And they aren't the only ones. Vera Wang, Dwayne The Rock Johnson, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Dhirubhai Ambani, the list goes on. Each of these personalities found their vocation much later in life. So, what can we learn from their success stories? Other than them being rich and famous, of course. Well, they're all living examples of people that didn't have it all figured out. They chose a career path and then pivoted, going after their passions defying any expectations people had of them. And no, I'm not saying I'm going to be the next Jeff Bezos or Mary Kong. What I am saying is that we don't need to slog away at the activities that we're doing just to get into a top tier college or job. Channeling that same energy into our interests can be just as lucrative in the long run. Now, I know, I know what you all are thinking. It's easy for me to sit here and talk to you about chasing happiness and your passions when I'm going to go right back to applying for college and preparing for it after this. And you're not wrong. I do think college is important and getting into the place that you aim for should absolutely be a priority. But I am also firmly of the opinion that in the quest to get that perfect college course or that job, we shouldn't lose sight of the things we love. So no, I'm not making a case for all of us to just give up our extracurriculars and our future pursuits. That would admittedly be a little hypocritical of me. What I am making a case for is for us to change our mindsets and the way we build our resumes. The moment we realize that we dislike something we're doing, it's important to take a step back and assess what's amiss. For artistic endeavors, it's always a good idea to change up your style and take frequent breaks to prevent the monotony and repetitiveness that sets in. In some situations, we're lucky enough to be able to drop the activity, course or project that we've come to dislike, choosing to take something that aligns with our passions better. While in other aspects of our life, we have no option but to stick with it. These are the moments when we need to ask ourselves what we can do to make it more bearable and interesting. Maybe changing up your style, maybe adding in more elements, Far too many of us are stuck in the same routines and box ourselves in. We need to remember that alternatives do exist should we have the courage to pursue them. And if the avenues for your passion simply don't exist yet, well, that's just a sign for you to go where no one else has gone before. It certainly isn't easy. Writing the stop wasn't and finding a solution to my piano conundrum all those months ago definitely was not. I don't have the cheery and optimistic answers you might find in a self-help column, because the truth is that I'm still playing the piano and still attending classes all this time later. But what I have done is taken a step back to see what I can do to make this more pleasurable for myself. I took a two month hiatus and decided to switch up my style of pieces from classical to more modern. I decided not to take an exam this year, opting to go slow. 
All of this didn't lead to some big love for the instrument coming back. But on the plus side, I don't dislike it anymore either. Compromising on our activities is never easy. We've spent hours and days and years putting our energy into them. And this isn't just about extracurriculars. It's about every aspect of our lives. Whether it's higher education, getting a PhD, joining a new job, or taking up a project. You might ask yourself, what's a little suffering if it gets me where I want to be? And you're not wrong. I'm guilty as charged. But if we can do something to make the journey more tolerable for ourselves, why not? If we can broaden our horizons and channel our energy into things that we enjoy, why falter? If you can drop something, do it in a heartbeat. We should never have to give up our happiness and personal growth for something that ultimately gives us meaningless validation. Enroll in projects that you love, projects that challenge you and teach you skills that you can use for the rest of your life. Yes, there are no quick fixes. And I shall likely be reminding myself of that for the next two years as I continue playing the piano. But tiny changes go long, long way. Too many of us are not living our dreams. We're living our fears. It's about time we change that. Thank you.